So good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Arvind Krishnan, one of the co-chairs of the India Conference 2017. Welcome to the keynote speech uh, by Dr. Shashi Tharoor. I have the immense privilege of introducing Dr. Tharoor, who really doesn't need any introduction. An eloquent orator, a best-selling author, an accomplished politician, and former international civil servant, Dr. Shashi Tharoor straddles several worlds of experience. This introduction is even more special to me because Dr. Tharoor is currently serving as the second Lok Sabha MP of my own constituency, Thiruvananthapuram. He also serves as the Chairman of the Parliamentary Standing Committee on External Affairs and has previously served as the Minister of State for Human Resource Development and also as External Affairs in the Government of India. During his nearly three-decade-long prior career at the United Nations, he served as a peacekeeper, refugee worker, and administrator at the highest levels, serving as Under Secretary General. Dr. Tharoor is also an award-winning author of 15 books of both fiction as well as nonfiction. In 1998, the World Economic Forum in Davos named him a global leader of tomorrow. He's also a recipient of several awards that include a Commonwealth Writers' Prize and the Pravasi Bharatiya Samman, India's highest honor for overseas nationals. Among numerous other awards are one for New Age Politician of the Year from NDTV, the Hakim Khan Sur Award for National Integration, and the Priyadarshini Award for Excellence in Diplomacy. Dr. Shashi Tharoor was a pioneer in using social media as an instrument of political interaction and is one of India's most followed politicians on Twitter. Today, Dr. Tharoor will be speaking on the topic India in the post-globalization world. The last few years have seen the rise of nationalism and protectionism placing the trend of globalization under immense threat. India, with its enormous demographic dividend and ever-growing market, is poised to play a key role in this world. These interesting times provide the perfect setting for this keynote address as we explore India's role in this world filled with contradictions. May I welcome Dr. Tharoor to the stage. Thank you. Thank you, Arvind, for that generous introduction, and uh, great to see you all here. I must say that uh, it's good to be back at Harvard uh, after appearing in this same conference last year, but your weather is a welcome reminder of why I left in the first place. <laughs> uh, anyway, glad some of you braved it. I realize the numbers are somewhat depleted from last year, but those of you who did make it, despite the weather and despite the lunch hour, very, very good to see you all. Last time I spoke about India's soft power in a globalizing world, and so to be here in Boston the uh, year after talking about the post-globalizing world is a mark really of, of how much has changed and yet how much hasn't changed. I must say that there's clearly no escaping the forces that have today enveloped our world and that are threatening in some ways to unravel globalization as we speak. Now this time I figured I should sort of follow good Harvard Business School norms and give you folks some takeaways from my lecture. So I thought about making a few specific points today to make it easier for you to remember what I've said or if I've said anything worth remembering. And uh, that in turn reminded me as a history buff of President Woodrow Wilson, who famously announced 14 points uh, to end the First World War. And when he announced his 14 points, the then French president, Georges Clemenceau, said 14 points. Even the good Lord only needed 10. <laughs> so um, I think since uh, I don't want to compete with the good Lord uh, or even President Wilson, I'll use half his list and try and come up with seven points uh, on the broader theme of India and the post-globalization world. So the first one, the seemingly paradoxical or contradictory, is that there is no escaping globalization. When I left to uh, come to the US to graduate school at the Fletcher School back in 1975, the word globalization was not in use anywhere in the world. Crossing borders was still a big deal. Getting a US visa was no easy thing. And I arrived in an America where to be an Indian here still carried a whiff 
of the exotic and the unfamiliar. Then globalization became so widespread that the phenomenon was everywhere. And here I am addressing a Harvard Business School whose dean is from India originally. Uh, that is a different world from the one I discovered here 42 years ago. Now, when I say globalization is everywhere, I mean, I, it really has infected our everyday lives to the point where our most commonplace headlines seem to reek of globalization. What do I mean? Take, for example, the headlines just a little over a decade ago about the tragic death of Princess Diana. What's that got to do with globalization, you may ask? Well, think of it this way. An English princess with a Welsh title leaves a French hotel with an Egyptian companion who has supplanted a Pakistani. She gets into a German car with a Dutch engine that is driven by a Belgian chauffeur full of Scottish whiskey. They're then chased by Italian paparazzi on Japanese scooters and mobikes into a Swiss-built tunnel where they crash. A rescue is briefly attempted by an American doctor using Brazilian medicines, and the whole story is told to you in Boston by the Indian MP from Tiruvananthapuram. That's globalization. <laughs> So it really is everywhere now, unlike 75, and it's impossible to avoid, so much so that it now animates movements of resistance to it. What does it mean, on the other hand, uh, for a country like India, which was anything but globalized when I left it, uh, and is very globalized today? What does it mean to be a young person, like most of you here in India? It can mean waking up to an alarm clock made in China, uh, downing a cup of tea from leaves first planted by the British, donning jeans designed in America and taking a, a Japanese scooter or a Korean car to an Indian university where your essays may be written on a Taiwanese laptop assembled in Malaysia or while your textbooks are printed with German-invented uh, German technology on paper first pulped in Sweden. You might call your friends on a Finnish mobile phone if you're still stuck with a Nokia or more likely perhaps uh, a South Korean mobile phone these days. Uh, to invite them to an Italian pizza, or even what you think of as an Indian meal, featuring naan that came to us from Persia, tandoori chicken taught to us by rulers from Uzbekistan, and aloo and hari mirch, potatoes and green chilies for the uninitiated, that first came to India just 400 years ago from Latin America. And the most desi thing of all, of course, is suspicion of anything foreign. Now, in such a world, issues that once seem far away are very much in your backyard, precisely why, perhaps, today we see a push against globalization. After all, it's easier to control happenings in your backyard as opposed to events far away that still have a bearing on your life. Whether you like it or not, what happens in East Asia or South Africa, from protectionist politics to deforestation, desertification, the fight against AIDS, can affect your lives where you live right here in North America. And your own choices anywhere, what you buy, how you vote, can resound far away, as we have all seen with the worldwide reactions and economic tremors following the election of Donald Trump. As someone once said about water pollution, we all live downstream. Some seem, seem to think that the stream can be dammed up and that walls can be built, but I think that may, they may discover that will simply lead to an overflow. And of course, walls are made for tunnels to be dug. So my second point is the backlash, backlash to globalization is gaining pace. While overall, one can convincingly argue that globalization has made the world a better, safer, and more prosperous place, the manner in which its benefits have been distributed has admittedly been uneven. In the last 20 years in particular, inequalities in income have become stark, and many of the promises that globalization widely advertised during its heady rush have not actually been delivered. This has led to resentments and rejection from both left and right. Here in the US alone, where the bottom 90%, or 99% as they say they are, have endured income stagnation for a third of a century, we have seen a backlash um, 
the Occupy Wall Street movement of young people claiming to represent the excluded, the insurgency of Bernie Sanders, and so on. All this on the left, and then the revolt of the unemployed, bitter, and increasingly xenophobic white blue-collar workers on the right who have propelled Mr. Trump into the White House. The vote against Hillary Clinton, especially in states that have typically voted for Democrats, was in large part because she was seen as part of a globalized elite linked to Wall Street. I mean, those may have been well-paid speeches at Goldman Sachs, but they obviously turned out to be the most expensive speeches she could possibly have made. Now, the 2008 economic crisis, of course, is what lay behind all of this for all of you in America. Ruchi Sharma refers to the world as BC in the sense of before crisis and AC after crisis, uh, with 2008's recession being that turning point. The BC years, he says, were full of optimism despite smaller economic crises in different parts of the world. There was confidence that the poor were becoming richer. Millions of people were rising out of poverty every year. Democracy and freedom were inevitable even in the worst dictatorships, and the world itself had transformed itself into one global village. It felt like a sort of historic golden age had begun, and there was every reason to be seduced by this narrative when the going was good. Some, however, have argued that these initial successes of globalization hid rising tensions within the communities. In the US, for example, within the US, a big gulf between the interior and the coast, for instance, grew up. And of course, all of these problems reached ahead after 2008. So that's why since 2008, what we see is more and more talk about anti-globalization. The numbers speak for themselves. In 2007, and I know you guys are used to numbers, so I shouldn't worry too much, but I'll rattle them off. The flow of global capital reached a record high of $9 trillion with a 16% share of the global economy. In 2014, the very year that Prime Minister Narendra Modi came to power in India as an anti-status quo, anti-ancien regime hero, the flow of capital stood at $1.2 trillion, or 2% of the global economy. So $9 trillion seven years earlier, $1.2 uh, in 2014. 16% in 2007? 2% in 2014. And that, by the way, was the same percentage value of capital flows that the world saw in 1980. The world, in terms of numbers, had gone back decades. At, um, uh, and, and in fact, in many ways, global trade has been growing at a pace slower than the global economy, which has not been growing very fast either. At the time of the so-called crisis, Exports touched 186% of Singapore's GDP, 60% of Taiwan's GDP, but once the crisis began and global trade took a beating, their economies that were so reliant on exports took, began shrinking at alarming rates and they were forced to look at other means of growth rather than relying on trade. Meanwhile, in the developed world, populist objections rose to globalization. Uh, for instance, China's trade with its Western partners Partners has, one could argue, brought vast benefits to consumers in the West. But it's equally true that large numbers of workers in the West have lost their jobs in the process. The current generation in OECD countries will be the first in the modern age to find themselves with a standard of living lower than that of their parents. The response from leaders have been increasing political denunciation of global trade. Hostility to foreigners, especially immigrants, and imposition of austerity measures, which again in turn tend to hurt the poor more than they hurt the rich. The poor and the unemployed then see that they have no stake in the globalized system. They demand to know why government policies made by their governments are benefiting people in faraway lands uh, with what used to be their jobs. And they want to go back to the security of their own all familiar economy and jobs and identity. That's what made the Make America Great Again slogan so irresistible to so many people just three months ago. Third, where you stand on globalization often depends on where you live. Indeed, globalization and today's anti-globalization is also what people make of it. In 2002, according to a Pew poll, 
78% of Americans thought that foreign trade was of great advantage to the American economy and to the country. Just six years later, by the time of the crisis in 2008, same poll, same pollster, the number had dropped to 53%. That's a 25% drop in six years, okay? Countries that were economic powerhouses and have faced the worst of the crisis, countries like France, Japan, and of course the US, are the states now negotiating major regional trade agreements in the face of skepticism about globalization amongst their own voting publics. Pew found in 2014 that 66% of respondents in developing countries held the view that international trade creates jobs, okay, 66 in developing countries like India, compared to 44% in developed countries. 25% in the developed world believes that trade raises wages, whereas 55% in the developing world say it does. A Center for Economic Policy Research report in India notes that in the first 10 months of 2015 alone, G20 countries imposed 443 new trade distortions, 40% more than they had in 2014. When questioned about this, the argument was that national circumstances demand such measures, and that is what leads to their protectionist policies. Britain alone, for instance, has introduced 200 barriers in trade since 2008, but they're only the third highest after the US and, surprise, surprise, Germany. So these are the countries that have actually brought in more restrictions, barriers, distortions, protectionist measures since 2008. Then look at rising inequality. Central banks have been flushing out money, which instead of enabling job growth as intended, finds its way largely into financial assets owned by the rich. Since 2008, wage growth, growth everywhere has been weak, but returns for the wealthy continue to be stout. In the UK, for example, wages have grown only by 13%, but the stock market is up by 115%. Guess who has the stocks and guess who's getting the wages? Credit Suisse found in a recent study that out of 46 major economies around the world, wealth, economy, wealth inequality was on the rise before 2007 in 12 of them. But today, the same economies, 35 have seen a spike in wealth, wealth inequality. Median income for full-time male workers is actually lower in real inflation-adjusted terms than it was 42 years ago. And at the bottom, they're comparable to levels 60 years ago. Okay? That's in real terms. Add to this the fact that the total population of billionaires in the world has increased to 1,800, provoking class resentment at the concentration of the wealth in the hands of the few. They're not few enough not to be noticed or not to be envied, but they're enough to be resented. 70 of these 1,800 billionaires live in one city, London. And if Brexit was a vote from which London stood aside by voting stay, in a way it might also have been the rest of the UK voting against London and its elite by preferring to leave. Fourth, the problem is spreading, but not yet to India. Anti-globalization sentiment has one support in globalization's cradles, as I've described to you. Protectionist barriers have gone up in those very nations that have for years advocated the free flow of goods, labor, and capital. President Trump promises to bring back jobs that have been lost to China. Europeans like Gert Wilders in the Netherlands hail his victory as a good augury and say they too want to take their country back from the forces of globalization. Marine Le Pen in France just last week used a speech in which she declared her candidacy for president to denounce the forces of globalization that she said she was fighting against. Neighbors have become less welcome in these countries. International banks have become increasingly nervous about issuing loans abroad. Tellingly, in the last decade, according to Freedom House, the number of states in which political rights have been declining has surpassed those in which they have been increasing. 110 countries around the world 
have actually found themselves with some loss of freedom in this decade alone. The number of democracies is not reduced, but within these democracies, freedom has slowly but steadily eroded or been diluted. The developed world, unused for generations to dealing with such grave problems and so many disruptive forces, seems to be retreating into a shell and even going backwards in history. India, however, interestingly enough, is resisting this trend. For all the nativism and religious chauvinism that his success has unleashed, Prime Minister Narendra Modi remains resolutely committed to globalism and free trade, and his government's new budget speaks of liberalizing foreign direct investment even further. I should add somewhat ruefully that when my lot were in government, the BJP strongly opposed foreign direct investment. But you know, as the old line goes, where you stand depends on where you sit. And now they're sitting in government and they're in favor of it. As it happens, India's had some experience for all of its modern existence, including after independence in 1947, with constantly battling the challenges of competing identities, disruption, poverty, and worse. India strikes many as maddening, chaotic, inefficient, and seemingly unpurposeful as it muddles its way forward into the 21st century. But India, as the British historian E.P. Thompson wrote, is perhaps the most important country for the future of the world. All the convergent influences of the world run through this society, he said. There is not a thought that is being thought in the West or the East that is not active in some Indian mind. Unquote. I'm glad a Brit said that and not an Indian. But the importance of India is nowhere more apparent today than in the discourse about the country's place and prospects in a trembling world economy. There are lessons from its past for the wider world at large and proactive measures to be taken today so that we do not get left behind in a post-global universe. Which leads me to my fifth point, that India has made a paradigm shift in order to get here. 20 years ago, on the occasion of the 50th anniversary of India's independence, I wrote a book called India from Midnight to the Millennium. In it, I focused on India as a country standing on the cusp of several important debates facing the world at the beginning of the 21st century. One of the debates I discussed then was globalization versus self-reliance. Should India, where economic self-sufficiency had been a mantra for more than four decades, open itself further to the new economy, to the world economy, I asked. India's global economic status since then is quite a change. Since for more than four decades after independence, India suffered from what I call the economics of nationalism, which equated political independence with economic self-sufficiency and largely isolated India from the world economy. In other words, we've already been where the rest of the world is headed with such enthusiasm. Why? Well, because the East India Company came to trade and stayed on to rule. So our nationalist leaders were suspicious of every foreigner with a briefcase, seeing him as the thin end of a neo-imperialist wedge. The feeling was, yeah, they say they want to trade or invest with you, but what they really want to do is rule you. We know that. That's what the East India Company did. So instead of integrating India into the global capital system, as very few post-colonial countries like Singapore were to do, India's leaders were convinced that the political independence they'd fought so long and hard for could only be guaranteed by economic independence. And so self-reliance became the slogan, the protectionist barriers went up, and India spent about 45 years after independence with the best and noblest of intentions, sitting bureaucrats rather than businessmen on the commanding heights of the economy, spending a good part of the first four and a half decades in subsidizing unproductivity, regulating stagnation, and trying to distribute poverty. Which only goes to prove that one of the lessons you learn from history is that history can sometimes teach you the wrong lessons. Now, rulers, like many around the world today, mistrusted what ordinary people could achieve for themselves when they were freed from the limitations of borders and boundaries, both physical and of the mind, to pursue their own prosperity within a framework of government-supported structures 
that ensured a level playing field, fair regulation, and social justice. The very model that came to be adopted in Western democracies, though perhaps increasingly dismantled in Republican-ruled America, and being smashed even further now. Instead, India created a license permit quota right that denied Indian businesses the opportunity to prosper and grow. It's sadly impossible to quantify the economic losses inflicted on our country over four decades of entrepreneurs frittering away their energies in queuing for licenses rather than manufacturing products, paying bribes instead of hiring workers, wooing politicians instead of understanding consumers, and getting things done, that favorite phrase, through bureaucrats rather than doing things for themselves. It took a financial crisis in 1991, as you all know, to prompt India to change course with Dr. Manmohan Singh as finance minister, memorably invoking Victor Hugo in his famous 1991 budget speech, in which he said, no power on earth can stop an idea whose time has come. Well, that idea, as you know, was that of the economic liberalization of the country, and that liberalization in an increasingly globalized world has changed India irreversibly. As I demonstrate in my new book, An Era of Darkness, the British had conquered one of the richest countries in the world, and over 200 years of loot, plunder, and expropriation had reduced it by 1947 to one of the poorest, most backward, illiterate, and diseased societies on earth. From 1900 to 1947, the rate of growth of the Indian economy was below 0.01%, while population grew steadily at well over 3.5%. Imperial rule left a society when the Brits left with 18% literacy, practically no domestic industry, and over 90% living below what we today call the poverty line. The impoverishment of India was the starkest reality that India's nationalist leaders had to face. They did what they thought was the right thing to do to end this poverty. It didn't work well enough or fast enough, so a generation ago we started doing something else. The results are there for all to see. The country has visibly prospered, and despite population growth, per capita income has grown faster and higher in each of these years than ever before. In the last 24 years, India has pulled more people out of poverty than in the previous 44, averaging some 10 million people a year in the last decade. It's ironic that this is only proved possible by outgrowing the economics of nationalism. And what is worrying is that we are now again on the brink of an age of neo-nationalism. And ironically enough, the poster children of, of, of globalization, the United States and Europe, are in the forefront of it. India is a new convert to the old cause of globalization. And thanks to it, we've really risen to be the world's third largest economy after the US and China, having overtaken Japan in PPP terms. Uh, purchasing power parity terms, till Mr. Modi's disastrous demonetization in November, we were also the fastest growing economy in the world, a position which, thanks to him, we have now again ceded to China. Our meteoric rise has been fueled by a remarkable shift in economic fortunes. During a period when growth remained modest or sluggish across much of the industrialized world, India's GDP grew a remarkable 7.2%, in 2014. Despite stock market fluctuations, we grew at 7.6% in 2015 16, and despite demonetization, the IMF thinks we'll still grow at 6.6% this year. A sustained 8% per annum growth looked possible at one time and could still be achieved in a few years with the potential to transform the nation in 20 years, with per capita income then, if that happens, crossing the $10,000 mark. A lot of this has to do with the fact that India is plugged in to the global economy like never before. We are one of the most globalized economies on earth, and that's quite a paradigm shift. At the same time, we still play our own game. Even as the world faced an unprecedented global economic crisis in 2008 onwards and recession, India continued to grow at a time when pretty much every country you can think of had at least one quarter of negative growth in the last five years. Many reasons have been attributed for India's success. First, our, our banks and financial institutions were not tempted to buy the toxic 
mortgage-supported securities and engage in the fancy derivative swaps and so on, credit default swaps that ruin several Western financial institutions. Second, through our, though our merchandise exports did register declines of about 30%, and they weren't very high to begin with, our services exports continued to climb. Third, remittances from our overseas Indian community. That's something you really have to remember. The faith of blue-collar workers in the Gulf and places like that in India, they're sending their money back. Right through this crisis period, this BCAC period, 55.75 billion in remittances alone, US dollars, in 2009-10, 70 billion in 2013, they've stayed at that level. And, and, and that's, that's also helped keep the, the economy thriving. And of course, most of our GDP, of our final point, still does not come from the, from the external sector, but from Indians producing goods and services for other Indians. And that's been part of the resilience of the Indian economy. So those were the, the reasons for why I think India continues to do well despite these global trends I've described to you. But going back to my list of seven, my sixth point, we still have a lot of problems to overcome. We're now at a crossroads in the world when a new architecture for the global order seems to be in contemplation. And many of the battles that India has been fighting and must continue to fight are also the battles that other nations confront. The prestigious Forbes magazine list of the world's top billionaires had to make room for $90 billionaires, Indian dollar billionaires, in 2015. With a combined net worth of $295 billion, greater than the GDP of a majority of member states of the United Nations. So there are 90 Indians whose collective worth is more than, the, than a majority of the member states of the United Nations. At the same time, we have 363 million people living below the poverty line. And it's not the UN or World Bank's poverty line of $1.25 a day, but the Indian poverty line, which in rural areas is calculated at 32 rupees or 50 cents a day. In other words, a line that's been drawn just this side of the funeral pile. Globalization or post-globalization, this is our reality. And this is what we must address creatively, quickly, and securely. We've trained world-class scientists and engineers, but 431 million of our compatriots are still illiterate, and we also have more children who have never seen the inside of a school than any other country in the world does. We have a great demographic advantage in theory. 65% of the population is under 35. 50.1% is under 25. 287 million in the age group of 10 to 22 which means we should have a dynamic, youthful, productive workforce for the next 40 years when the rest of the world, including China, is aging. The average age in 2020 in Europe will be 46. In Japan, it'll be 47. Even in the US, it'll be 40. And if Mr. Trump keeps all the immigrants out, it could even be higher. In India, it'll be 29. So it could work, but we also have 4.3 million child laborers, 40% of the children in our government schools drop out by the eighth grade. We have 487 million people in our workforce, but more than two thirds of our employers say they're struggling to find employable workers because our workers don't have the needed skills. In India, only 2.3% of the workforce has received training in formal skills, and that compares with 52% in the US, 68% in the UK, and a staggering 92 or 93 percent in Germany. So the system is potentially a huge, huge nightmare. A demographic disaster could await us instead of a demographic dividend. We celebrate India's IT triumphs, and so we should, but information technology has employed a grand total of five million Indians in India in the last 20 years, maybe a few more in this country, but 5 million in India, while 10 million people are entering the workforce each year. Many of our urban youth rightly say with confidence that their future will be better than their parents' past. But there are Maoist insurgencies violently disturbing the peace in 165 of India's 602 districts. And these are largely made up of unemployed young men. 
with opportunities that come from global trade and globalization itself now under threat, we can be sure of more troublesome conditions in managing our large numbers and creating productive opportunities for them and guaranteeing sustainable futures for our citizens. Mr. Modi is saying make in India at a time when developed countries are saying make at home and where increasing autom automation, artificial intelligence, all that is ensuring that many of these jobs are not going to be done by human beings of any nationality in any case. Now, we may yet be able to weather the storm, because even during the best phases of our growth in recent years, growth was never only about per capita income figures or enabling business. It was always a means to an end. And the ends we cared about were the uplift of the weaker sections of our society, the expansion of possibilities for them, the provision of decent health care, clean drinking water. And these ends remain, whether we grow by 9% as we once did, by 7% as we did last year, by 6% as we might this year, whatever it might be, our fundamental commitment has to be to the bottom 25% of our society. It was a failure to recognize this principle that today has the global world order in a state of chaos. So that the 25% left out of the changes of the last decades rebelled against a system, riding on the backs of strongmen and women whose principal qualification appears to be their ability to tap into discontent and outrage. As Joseph Stiglitz has argued, the central problem, even in advanced economies, was never globalization itself, but the manner in which it was allowed free reign, offering opportunity unfairly, while not guaranteeing social protection against technology-driven disruptions and other forces of the market that run amok. In India, on the contrary, though not with 100% success, I'll admit, efforts were made by the UPA government, of which I was a part, to create precisely those safety nets to help those left behind by globalization to weather disruption and to make it easier for them to build something new in a changing world. I often used to argue, I've said so in Parliament as well, that the magic of the market cannot appeal to people who can't afford to enter the marketplace. Let's enable them. Give them the basics so they can enter the marketplace and then you can, you can develop your market forces. We enabled businesses and drew uh, benefits from globalization, but we were not blinded from our greater responsibilities by early successes. So something like the Mahatma Gandhi National Rural Employment Guarantee Scheme, for example, which was lambasted by the opposition and others across the board as a waste of resources. Um, but of course, when the recent demonetization debacle in India disrupted the informal economy that provides most Indians their sustenance, it was to this Enrega scheme that workers turn for jobs and income and food on the table. And the prime minister and the finance minister have announced increased budgetary allocations for this very scheme that they had denounced for the last five years. The result is that in 2017, uh, the present go the Modi government's budget has given the highest ever budgetary allocation to Enriga in history. So, seventh, where do we go from here? How can India negotiate a post-globalization world where international institutions of global governance are challenged and slowly proving to be ineffective, and when the very architects of this order seem to be withdrawing from it. One only has to look at China to get a sense of how much the West, which was the founder of globalization after the Second World War, is besieged by paranoia about its loss of control over an order of its own making, a reflection of Western populations and their angst. In 1980, the Chinese share of the global economy stood at about 2%, while the US represented 23%. By 2014, both China and the US have about 16% of the global economy. A situation like this is not unprecedented. In the early years of the 20th century, it was the US that eclipsed Great Britain, taking the world from an age of Pax Britannica to one of Pax Americana. They were their allies, designed a new world order. Now that another power seems set to exercise a certain dominance in the world, rules will need to be rewritten, creating naturally a certain imbalance in the process. For India, this will mean focusing on the reality of a multipolar world. Let me illustrate what this means with an example. 
Our foreign minister meets every year with her Russian and Chinese counterparts in a gathering known as RIC. Then she adds the Brazilians and the South Africans, and she has an annual meeting with the BRICS. Then she takes out the Russians and the Chinese and meets with Brazil and South Africa in Ibsa for South-South cooperation. And then she adds the Chinese, but not the Russians, in BASIC for environmental negotiations. And India is the only country that's a member of all of these, not merely because our name happens to begin with that most useful element in every acronym, a vowel, but also because we have something meaningful to contribute to each of these groups and to gain from each of these groups. It's a model of that world word can be applied for future engagements around the globe with most countries that are unhappy with overarching global systems and would prefer to deal with smaller groups on specific terms on specific issues. In 2012, when I wrote my book, Pax Indica, India and the World of the 21st Century, I described India contributing to and starring in a global network, which is really what will define international relations, in my view, in the 21st century, or the bits of it that we can foresee. My metaphor for this world is that of the World Wide Web, a planet of interconnections, some overlapping, some not, that knit us all together in, ways, in the ways in which we choose to be connected. It's a long way from the days when Indian diplomacy was compared to the lovemaking of an elephant. Have I not tried that one on you yet? No, maybe I didn't mention it last year. An old grizzled diplomat said to me, Indian diplomacy is like the lovemaking of an elephant. It is conducted at a very high level, accompanied by much bellowing, and the results are not known for two years. <laughs> now, that was a long time ago. I think Indian diplomacy has become a lot more sprightly since then. And today's network world has seen Indian diplomacy becoming even more effective and fast moving. For India, this kind of worldwide web style networking reflects other paradoxes of our world. India can play an influential role with both the United Nations, which is a universal organization that has 193 member states, and in South Asia, either with SARC, where we are only with all our neighbors, or with BIMSTEC, where we are with most of our neighbors leaving out a particularly obstreperous one. India belongs both to the non-aligned movement, which reflects our colonial heritage, our legacy of fighting colonialism, but also to the community of democracies, where we work alongside the very countries we're railing against in the non-aligned movement. We are a leading light of the global trade union of developing countries, the G77. The group of 77, which has 120 countries, don't ask. It's one of those typical UN things. But while we are a member of the Global Trade Union of Developing Countries, we are also a member of the global management of the world macroeconomy as a leading light of the G20. So we have the great ability to be in all these seemingly paradoxical institutional networks, pursuing different objectives with different allies and partners, and in each finding a valid purpose that suits us. That's why I suggested when I was briefly Minister of State for External Affairs, that India had moved beyond non-alignment to what I called multi-alignment, though I must admit that the phrase hasn't caught on. But then I was only a minister of state, and as I've explained in the past, being a minister of state is rather like standing in a cemetery. There are lots of people under you, but nobody's listening. <laughs> now, regional groups are also one way to manage in a, in a new shifting global system. And the new form the global order will take may well be shaped by the East or the global South that cannot afford to retreat, unlike the West, which is still in a position of relative prosperity to seek Brexits and other exits from globalization. Take, for instance, the BRICS, which in its original embodiment was identified as those nations whose rapidly growing economies were challenging the size and preponderance of the G7 a revolt against the global elite of the world order, if you will. In the last 15 years, Brazil, Russia, and India have caught up with the smallest G7 economy, Italy, in terms of nominal GDP, while China has overtaken the second largest uh, G7 economy, Japan, also in nominal terms. Together, the nominal GDP of the BRICS is similar to that of the European Union or the United States and will, in all likelihood, overtake both in the not-so-far-away future. I think it was Goldman Sachs that has predicted that by 2040, 
the BRICS will account collectively for more of global GDP than the original G7 countries put together. Now, there's a transformation for you. What is it that draws the BRICS close as nation states? As it happens, one major attribute all BRICS members share is their exclusion from the places they believe they deserve in the existing world order. And being denied legitimate positions on the global stage by today's dominant powers is proving to be a very strong glue that holds the BRICS countries together. The BRICS Forum provides a platform for these non-OECD leaders to discuss global challenges and coordinate their actions both within and outside existing global institutions. The fact is that the share of world merchandise trade of the BRICS increased from 7% in 2001 to more than 17% last year after the crisis and the recession. It's not an exaggeration to argue that if they apply themselves, the new post-globalization world order could be designed by these countries on terms that are better than what was on offer earlier. It is an axiom of international affairs that you're either at the table or on the menu. India feels it has earned the right to be at the table. We've been for too long a rule taker in the global system and the post-globalization world offers us the ability to become rule makers in the emerging world. I'm going to cheat a bit and behave like an MBA. I promised you seven points, so I'll give you an eight. Take it as your bonus. The post-globalization world is a time for affirming diversity. The leaders of tomorrow will have to know both how to live with change in a varied and diverse world and how to live with contradictions. I mean, I've often joked that anything I say about India, the opposite is also true. We like to think of ourselves as an ancient civilization, but we're also a young republic. Our IT experts are striding forth confidently into the 21st century, but the majority of our population is still living in each of the 20 other centuries. Now, quite often, however, what's interesting is that these opposites exist quite cheerfully. One of my favorite images of India is from the Kumbha Mela, in which there is a classic photograph going around the internet of this Hindu sage, a naked holy man, right out of central casting, right? He's got matted hair, wispy beard, broken teeth, what's on his face. His bare torso is, is thin. He's got a Rudraksha mala, mala and ash smeared forehead, all of that stuff. And he's staring away into the distance, which in the old days would have been the classic picture of timeless otherworldliness. But in this photograph from the Kumbh Mela, this naked holy man is chatting away on a mobile phone. <laughs> that is today's India. And, and that's the, you've got to learn to embrace the possibilities and the complications that represents. And one of the other paradoxes of our globalizing world is that if the 20th century has made the world safe for democracy, the 21st century has to make it safe for diversity. The world as a whole must reflect the idea that is already familiar to India and used to be familiar to the United States. That it shouldn't matter what the color of your skin is, the kind of food you eat, the sounds you make when you speak, the God you choose to worship or not, so long as you want to play by the same rules as everybody else and dream the same dreams. It's not essential in a democratic world to agree all the time, so long as you agree on the ground rules of how you will disagree. That's the secret in, in many ways of what India has learned. But before I go on, I've seen this young organizer standing there, and I realize we're all like Egyptian mummies strapped for time. So <laughs> let me pull my thoughts together. My basic point is that we have to think beyond the binaries of globalization and post-globalization to cooperative relationships in a networked and diverse world. Sovereign nation states will continue proudly to guard their sovereignty, and President Trump may even try to build his wall, though if he does, as I said earlier, I think the Mexicans will build a lot of tunnels. But the world will inevitably push nations together in ways that transforms the very definition of the word sovereignty and dilutes its old meanings. Every country wants to ensure the security and well-being of its own citizens. But the old autarkic ways of doing this will never work. And that's my message to the folks uh, in Washington. 
Most of us belong to countries that proudly and somewhat chauvinistically celebrate their Independence Day. But the time may come for all of us to realize that what we really ought to celebrate the rest of the time is something else. The recognition that every other day in the calendar in our still globalized world is really an interdependence day. Thank you very much, Jay. Thank you. I don't mind. Are they expecting questions? I'll take a couple. Wrap it up. We began a good 10 minutes later, so we actually... Uh, so we have time only for two questions. We have like four minutes left. So if anyone has questions, you can come to the two microphones on either aisle. Go ahead. Each minute seems to count. The mic doesn't work, which is why they asked you to come to it, I guess. <laughs> Louder, I'll repeat your question, yeah. All right, then come and use this mic. Come and join me, come on. Okay, everyone, I'll repeat the question for you. I know you're all busy answering questions to each other, but while this gentleman's here, he says that China, Xi Jinping made the statement uh, that uh, in defense of globalization, but there doesn't seem to be a consensus in Asia, he says. Many countries have their own agendas. India doesn't want to participate in OBOR. And the thrust of your question was, how do we deal with all of this? But I think one thing is very clear, that there are, possibilities to go ahead with a networked world, even if the original proponents of globalization choose to absent themselves from it, or temporarily from it, or in some ways from it, however we modify that sentence. China is obviously a key factor in this, which is why the BRICS matter. But there's going to have to be some flexibility in terms of how the countries in this networked world will choose to work with each other, as I said earlier. So India might choose to work with China in some aspects of BRICS and decline to work in others, though personally I would be in favor of us leaping onto one belt, one road, and benefiting from China's investments in that. At the moment, the government is not well disposed towards that idea, but we could still be cooperating with China on bilateral trade, which is already up at $70 billion. So the advantage of this worldwide web-style networking I described is you choose the issues in which you cooperate, but at least you have an option. It's not that America is the big 198-pound gorilla on the beach, and if they shut their borders, the rest of you are, 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 are doomed. No longer the case. You've got other options, and we will exercise them. Yeah. Is it working still? No. Is there a mic that's working that somebody... Yeah, go ahead. I think those who are at a mic that isn't working could just come here, perhaps. Yeah. I, I don't think it's going to be worth doing, nor will it be a, a, a good way of maintaining our current diplomatic relations with them. To my mind, uh, what we are looking for is atonement, and atonement has to come voluntarily. That is that people should genuinely feel remorse themselves. And I think a gesture such as I've recommended, which is a British Prime Minister or a member of the Royal Family coming to Jallianwala Bagh uh, at the centenary of that massacre, uh, which is now just two years away, and apologizing there would be a terrific gesture that would be a far more significant source of atonement. I think there would be great difficulties of the legal action, under what law, under which jurisdiction, who would acknowledge the jurisdiction, how would any judgment be enforced. I just don't think it's worth it, on top of which, 
in any case, today's relationship with today's Britain would be affected. And for us now, it's a relationship between two sovereign equal countries and equal economies. Why would we want to jeopardize it? I wouldn't worry about that today. Yeah. So we already have uh, taken this issue up very strongly, and my committee has authored a report uh, on the Foreign Service, including its numbers, its recruitment, its training, etc., which is up on the Lok Sabha website. So if you'll go on, uh, I think it's loksabha.nic.in, I wouldn't swear to it. Uh, please read my report. You will see exactly what we've recommended. And we do have a fairly sympathetic setup now in the Ministry of External Affairs. For example, our recommendations on lateral entry of uh, non-career diplomats into the Foreign Service has been accepted in part by the current Foreign Secretary. And I think he is very receptive. So I would not be surprised to see our proposals going up to the Cabinet for a significant increase in the size of the Indian diplomatic corps. It's absurd that a country like India has the same number of diplomats as Singapore or New Zealand, uh, and a fraction of Brazil, China, our peers in BRICS, uh, and of course, a tiny fraction of the US or other countries. So I agree with you, this is an issue I've been personally pursuing doggedly for years, and I, I intend to continue fighting it as long as I chair the Foreign Affairs Committee and can push it through. Thank you all very much.